Okay, we have Prof Lumumba. Prof Patrick Lumumba of Kenya had something very interesting to say. Listen to this. You know, one of the things that we must say and say categorically is that what happened on the seventh day of October, the year 2023, is or was unacceptable. It was wrong for Hamas to do what they did. But it is incumbent upon a state and Israel is a state, a state that was one of the first signatories, if not the first signatory of the Genocide Convention in 1948. And they did so because the Jews over the years have suffered discrimination. They suffered discrimination in Spain. They suffered discrimination in Germany. And we remember the Holocaust. So that holding all factors constant, if there is a single nation on earth that should ensure that lives are protected, that the crime of genocide is not perpetrated against any peoples on the ground of their nationality or religion, it is the Israelis. It therefore beggars belief and defeats reason when you listen to senior Israeli government officials, right from the president, President Herzog, is on record and is considered to be one of the more moderate Israelis, is on record as saying, we are dealing with human animals and we are not going to spare any of them. There is no non-military target in Gaza. In other words, women who are non-combatants are targets, children, are targets. The fighters themselves are targets. Hostels are targets. The Israeli defense minister gleefully said they will have no fuel, no water, no food. And one even went to the Bible in the book of Samuel and said, just like God ordered that the Amalekites be eliminated, so shall we eliminate the Palestinians in Gaza that no human being may ever live in Gaza again. Against that background, the reference by the Republic of South Africa to the International Court of Justice is decent, it is understandable, it is acceptable. I've read and reread the 48, the 84 page document. It is one of the most well prepared documentation presenting evidence of what constitutes the crime of genocide. And I believe that all men and women of goodwill throughout the world should support that reference because that is what international community ought to do in a civilized way in ways that are recognized and acceptable by the Committee of Nations. I cannot understand Kenya. I would understand Kenya if they condemned the act of Hamas on the 7th of October. But for them to say that we support the disproportionate response by the Israelis is one that defies logic. I don't know what is pushing my beloved Kenya to say that, but it is time that we revised our position. And unfortunately, I hold the view that in matters such as this, it would have been better if the African Union, as the African Union, held an emergency meeting of heads of states and governments so that we have a common position. Because this, this is critical. It is critical for our trade, it is critical for our relationship with very many countries in the world. And a common African position would have been preferred rather than to allow uh, individual countries to be manipulated and sometimes even coerced to take the positions that they have taken and which positions fly in the face of logic. That is one of the busiest maritime routes in the world. You will remember in the year 1956 when there was the Suez Canal cr crisis, the international trade was disrupted in a fundamental way. And we have seen recently during the war when the Houthis in Yemen have said that they are not going to allow navigation in that area, particularly as regards seagoing vessels that are headed to Israel. 
And we have seen that it is not possible to get it right all the time, with the consequence that seagoing companies such as Musk of Denmark have had to suspend almost 95% of their vessels from navigating through that route, which means that you are now taking a longer route. And if you are taking a longer route, it means that you increase the cost of insurance, it means the journey is longer, it means oil is going to become more expensive, and for those countries that are importing oil from that part of the world, it means, therefore, that the cost of living is going to be higher. And uh, it is not something that we ought not to take very seriously because the implications are dire and grave and it will be evident in many countries in the continent of Africa and indeed outside of the continent of Africa. And uh, that is why, therefore, the UN has actually uh, passed a resolution uh, saying that the Yemeni Houthis should not interfere with maritime trade in that particular part of the world. But the Houthis on their part have said that we are in fact ensuring that international law is given its pride of place by the war and the continuous bombardment on Gaza being stopped. And we now know that it has brought into the conflict to a certain extent the Americans and the British who have bombarded, as they say, it is very strategic precision bombing on the facilities on the ground, radar and other facilities in Yemen and even in Sana'a, the capital. And uh, the Houthis have said we are going to respond and our response is not going to be restricted to the region, it will be in whichever manner that we choose. This is not good. It is not good message. And it is something that could lead to anarchy and undermine trade and affect the economies of many countries in that region and outside of that region. You know, the United, Nation, the United States of America has always considered itself the policeman of the world since the 1945. And in many ways, they have said, we are the defenders of the free world. And of course, they are the ones who define what the free world is. We are the defenders of democracy. We have the largest economy, we have the largest army. We, in our estimation, are the strongest militarily on earth. And we, therefore, are the ones who are going to protect the world. And you've seen that the United States of America has, on many occasions, defied the UN. They have on many occasions defied the Security Council. They did that, as you know, jointly with the United Kingdom in the case of Iraq. We know they have done that in quite a number of cases. And we know that they are going to continue to do that in order to protect their economy, in order to protect the dollar, and in order to remain, in their view, the hegemon in the world. Is it a good thing? No. It is not a good thing when you have unilateralism, when a single nation, without reference to established institutions, chooses to do things which could undermine international peace. But who can stop them? This is the question. Because many nations, even the strongest nation on earth, who are, which are nuclear uh, uh, armed states are reluctant to get into what would be an Armageddon. China is not prepared to do so. Russia is not prepared to do so. The Western world, of course, is always aligned and, and are the lapdogs of the United States of America. Iran, beyond the rhetoric, is not prepared to do so because in the fullness of time, even if you think you can win a war, history has taught us that you can win the battle, but never the war. The history of Afghanistan told us, the history of Vietnam told us, and the world and the people of the world have no appetite for conflict because it visits pain upon all. But the politicians and the military industry in the United States of America sometimes does not hearken to voices of reason. It does what it does. 
with the consequences that are known to all of us, bad consequences. In matters such as these, to be neutral is to be dishonest. And we must condemn the acts of Hamas on the seventh day of October in the year 2023. But we must condemn also the Israelis for their disproportionate response. But I must condemn elements within the Palestinians who believe that violence will be the only way of solving this problem. So my personal sympathy is with the peoples of Palestine. And my wish is that we create an environment where the Palestinians will have a state of their own alongside Israel. And Israel, in my view, owing to its power that it enjoys today, is capable of facilitating the creation of a Palestinian state. Going back to Oslo and saying, let us have a Palestinian state on the basis of the 1967 boundaries. If that is done, we'll create a responsible state which is a full member rather than observer at the United Nations, which has international obligations, which if it misbehaves, will then be dealt with like a member of the International Committee of Nations. But if you retain the current situation where there is no Palestinian state, then organizations such as Hamas, Hezbollah, and many others which will mutate will always threaten the peace of Israel. And what Israel deals with as peace will always be peace that means nothing. There'll be no peace that they desire and deserve. In my view, therefore, two-state solution is the answer to this problem.